message number two in We Need to Talk. And you know, I love watching how God orchestrates because that was the perfect song to set up the perfect word to go into what I feel like God is wanting us to focus on this week and, and, and really just in our marriages to pick up something that, <clears throat> that, uh, that is helpful. Because that, that's, that, you know, that's, that's why we're here. That's why we organize. That's why we take time to rent a building and pay bills and show up and do things like this. It's not for a job and it's not for like personal gratification. It's like, no, we, we want to participate with what God is doing. And, and for me, it, it, it's, it's a pleasure to get to spend my time to organize my thoughts and follow God in such a way that, that it brings help to people. You know, I mean, people all over the world, and it, it's, an, it's an honor to get to do that, you know. <clears throat> I don't look at it as I am your authority. I am the man. This is all about me, and if you just get my word, you know what I mean? It's like oh, some places are like that, and I just don't, I just don't want, I don't want that. That's too much... Uh, it's a lot of work to control people. <laughs> anyway, that wasn't part of my message, but it just kind of was on my heart. So God bless you. Um, <clears throat> we need to talk. You ever, has your spouse ever said, we need to talk? And you're like, uh-oh, what did I do? Yeah. Uh-oh, what did I do? We need to talk. And, and I think if we talk more, then that we need to talk wouldn't arise. So... Just real quick, summary of last week, <clears throat> we worked from this principle here in communication, seek to understand, then seek to be understood. And we looked at how the Lord communicates with us. This is out of Psalm 116, verse 1 and 2. I love the Lord because He heard my voice. And so you can read this theologically and you can read it relationally. They are intertwined in my opinion. I think we lift out a lot of uh, relational truth for ourselves and we understand a little bit about God and how He relates to us and looking at something like this. So if you read it relationally, what the guy's saying is, like, God hears me and that makes me love Him. You know, so to me, this is in action the idea that says we love Him because He first loved us. Like, that's what it looks like, right? Like we hear statements like that, we love him because he first loved us. And it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you see something like this in action. This is in action, God loving us. And then the response is we love him. I love the Lord because he heard me. We all want to be heard, right? We all want to be seen. And those people that you feel like actually genuinely care about you, those are the people that you want to be around. Not just because they make you feel good, but if they're healthy in and of themselves, they sew back into you the things that help you break through those issues that you struggle with. So like the people that we trust are the ones that love us and they're the ones that we're open to the most. And hopefully they're healthy relationships that, you know, challenge us and listen to us and don't let us get away with our junk. But so there's a relational element in this. I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. So he, he gets me. He feels me. He understands where I'm at. You know, I need some mercy. This is difficult. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Amen? Now, I pray that that can be said of your relationships, especially within your marriage. Some of you aren't married, so look at it in terms of your whatever, how it fits into your relationship. But I pray that you can say this about your marriage. My spouse hears me, and I love them for that. I love that they take the time to listen to me and not try to fix, you know, that's that women are from Venus and men are from Mars type thing. It's like men want to try to fix. Not always. There are some women fixers out there too. I've met them. <clears throat> but typically we, we do that, right? Men, don't we want to? Our wife starts what we call complaining. And it's like, all right, problem, fix mode. Da -da 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 -da. A lot of times, you know, it's a lot of times if you let them talk long enough, they come to the solution themselves because they're like verbally processed and hear God along the way. You know, because that's what they're doing. They're wanting a sounding board to process. And when I say they, I don't mean women necessarily. I just mean verbal processors. So let's call it that. But they want to just talk it out. Think about it. You know, and, and a verbal processor will hear God better as they are verbally processing. 
Now, you might tweak a little bit, inject a little passage, or you know, help them along the way, but it's not your job to fix. Say, it's not my job to fix. The Holy Spirit's a better teacher than me. You didn't say it. Okay. It's close enough. So out of this, and there was another passage as well, but out of this we realize listening develops trust and listening develops confidence. That comes out of another passage that uh, says that, you know, he, he, if we ask anything of him, he hears us and it gives us confidence. And the word confidence was actually the word boldness and openness. So the whole idea here is that because he hears us, because he hears me, I love him and I love that he cares about me. And I love that he's interested in me and wants to know what I'm thinking and, and empathetically connects to me where I'm at. He feels me. He gets me. He understands what I'm going through. You know, it says that Jesus was tempted in all way like we are, yet without sin. We have a high priest who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Like God knows what it's like to be you because ultimately he has been you. He's been human and he faced everything that you face. You know, that, that, that's why he can be the great comfort. He's God, he's pretty smart, but he also stepped into this place to identify as a human. He knows what we're going through, amen? And he takes the time to listen. So the word confidence is boldness and openness and it's freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech, openly, frankly, without concealment. How many of you wish that your spouse would speak to you out concealment. How many of you have spouses and they beat around the bush? Don't don't raise your hand. I should have qualified that. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> you know, openness. Now, they might be beating around the bush because you explode and you can't listen to them when they try to talk to you. Hello. Free and fearless confidence, cheerful courage, boldness, and assurance. Assurance that they'll listen and that they'll hear. So today we're going to go into this idea of I am free when I set you free. Got a couple of passages here. And we're going to talk about the idea. So this Wednesday, I'm going to go through the DISC profile, the D-I-S-C behavioral profile. Some people call it a personality test. It's not really a personality test. The difference is your personality is you know, what you like to wear, the kind of music you like. Now, behaviorally, that stuff might be affected, but your personality is your person, you know, who you are. Your behavior is how you've learned to behave. All behavior is learned, meaning you can actually change your behavior. You know, psychologists for a long time believed that our brains were programmed at a young age and there was no changing it. You just had to cope with the programming that you had. Well, now we've learned that our brain is in a state of neuroplasticity. In other words, it grows new neuron networks so you can learn new patterns and actually naturally behave differently than you were programmed to when you were younger. You know, we adopt most of our beliefs about ourselves by the time we're age five and, you know, psycho the psychological world believed you were locked into that but you can actually change. The leopard actually can change its spots at this point because first off, for the believer, it's because we are transformed by the renewing of our mind and we put on the new man. We put on the truth of who we are now in Christ to change that stuff, you know? So when you lay aside an old sin habit and it has no effect on you any longer, you don't have those triggers, you're just free from that type of stuff, you've experienced transformation. And chemically in your, you know, physically in your brain, your brain would look different. So if you could analyze your brain when you had those difficult strat, those, those sin habits, to afterward when you genuinely have experienced freedom, it's not just in your soul and in your thinking. Your brain, your physiology actually changes. Your brain would look different. Your new networks of how you process thought actually changes and looks different. And so what we're realizing is you can engage intentionally in the process of mind renewal, changing how you think specifically about God and yourself and your physiology will follow suit. There's kind of like a, a tipping point. You kind of have to fight through it, but there's a tipping point of mind renewal where this new belief, this new pattern, hopefully it's based on who you are in Christ, <clears throat> will be your new programming. 
And that, that's, that's, that's really what, that's where we are in the Christian life at this point is we're safe and secure in Him. He's leading us and guiding us. And to the degree that we renew our minds, we put on the new man, we believe what actually happened to us in our spirit, and we engage in that repentant mind renewal process, everything about us will change. And it's just true. So behavior is learned. The reason we talk a lot about behavior is because people are different. You know, you are different from your spouse. You are different from your kids. You are different from your coworkers and your relatives and all these people. And so learning about behavior patterns helps you first and foremost understand you. Helps you understand how you naturally behave in a particular environment. Some people are more reserved. Some people are more outgoing. Some people are, you know, silent thinkers and processors. Some people are verbal processors. Some people are take charge and jump out there. Some people sit back and calculate things, you know, and these all reflect the DISC profile. And how it relates to marriage is we got we to gotta give each other space to let you be you. You know, that, that, that should be in our marriage vows. And I vow to let you be you till death do us part, right? But it should be. I will let you be you. Now, in a, you know, all things being equal, in a healthy environment, that they're pursuing the Lord. You know what I mean? I, I hate that I've got to qualify that stuff because there's always that one person sitting there going, well, what if they're a drug addict? What if they got this sin? And I'm like, seriously? Come on. Stop thinking that. Whoever's thinking that, stop it. Uh, <clears throat> so the goal is to understand ourselves and then try it. So in communication, you want to understand them. Like when someone is speaking to you, you want to get what they're saying. Because the model is the Lord, right? We love Him because He hears us, and we go to Him because we, hear, we trust Him. I want that to be true in our marriages as well. Marriage is a blessing. It just, it, I think, you know, I was thinking about that this week. Marriage is a blessing, isn't it? Mar marriage, I mean, somebody commits to you to help you your whole life. Wow. And you get to help them. Right? Think about that. You got somebody committed to to help you your entire life. Are you kidding me? What a blessing. <laughs> huh? Well, you know, that's one of those that's one of those Holy Spirit things. God told me to say that and then shut up like 2 days ago. Yeah. Cuz it's we we don't think about it that way. We just don't. We think about it in terms of how we think about it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it is a blessing. It is something that He designed to reflect our union with Him, that He is with us. He is our helper. He is our comforter. He hears us. He listens to us. He strategizes with us. He loves us. He happens to know everything. That's not you. You know what I mean? It's a blessing. Just think about that. Marriage is a blessing, isn't it? May we treat it so instead of focusing on all the stuff that's wrong. So that, that's why I think we go into these types of things, right? Because I would rather talk about our identity. But, but so I, actually I was asking the Lord, help me, help me really, you know, I don't, I don't want to just teach topical things. I want to really dig into what you're doing in your spirit and us and all this. But, and so I think he did that for me even. It's like, no, this is, I want you to remind people that I gave this as a blessing. That our union with each other on this planet is a reflection of our union with him. And we get to love each other to the degree that we show the world, no, this is what it's like to be connected with the Father. He's loving and he's helpful. He calls himself, he calls us his bride. In Isaiah, he says, I will betroth myself to you, you being the people who enter into this new covenant of peace that he's talking about. It's just a blessing. So we learn these types of things to protect the blessing. And we learn these types of things to sow into the blessing, modeling the character of God that we hear and we listen and we understand so that we're a safe person, open for this person's trust and that we get to trust them also. And then you get a bunch of other friends in the same type of context, you know. I love talking to my friends because I can say things and, and they'll hear me. 
and and it's sometimes it's good to just get stuff off your chest, right? But but in this concealment thing, you know, I, that word stood out to me this week about our relate our conversations with our spouses. You know, are we really a hundred percent honest and open? Are we? You know, it, to the degree to which you trust that person is the degree to which you will be open. That makes sense. You'll be as open as you trust them, as so it is with the Lord. You will be as open with the Lord as much as you trust Him, right? So all of those things that we're not letting Him transform and change and touch us and help us in, there's lots of factors there. We, we either don't trust Him, we don't know that we can trust Him, we've had bad experiences, we think we've prayed, but we weren't really open. You know, a lot of times we pray, but we're not really open. Like a lot of times we pray but we don't really expect to then be able to grab the grace to step into what it is we actually prayed for. We either don't want to take the responsibility or we just sit back and our theology says, you prayed, now it's up to him whether, he not, whether or not he's going to do anything. So this idea of I'm free when I set you free, I want to kind of zero in on the idea of judgment. So let's look at a few passages here. Think about how this relates to your marriage. Luke 6, 36, uh, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Sowing and reaping. This is not talking about the Lord judging you. This is talking about other people judging you. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardoned and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap. Who? Who? Not God. God judged you in Christ. Amen? It's important to know that. This is talking about sowing and reaping. This is talking about you want... you Are you, are you sick of being judged by people? Then quit judging them. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure. Now watch this. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. So in other words... You get back more than you gave. You ever, you ever experienced that? It's like you, you're poking somebody, you're messing with them, and a, man, they just come back like a flood, you know? And it's like, why'd you explode? That was a bit, that was a bit ex, you know, exaggerated. What, why'd, you, that's a, why'd you do that? That was just not a big deal. Well, it's a principle. It's a relational principle. You get back more than you gave out, especially this negative stuff. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Now, this is Matthew. This is really the same type of teaching, but it's said a little bit differently. Matthew 7, verse 1, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. In the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother, your sister, your children's, your spouse's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You know, it's like you've seen the image, right? If I got this board in my eye and I try to take yours out, I'm probably poking you with this plank in my eye, you know. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother, your spouse's, your children's eye. Amen. All right, so the word judge here in the Greek is krino, krino, and it's to pronounce an opinion concerning right or wrong. You know, and there's a lot of judgment within Christianity of each other and each denomination, and it's based on who's right, who's wrong. You know, there are certain groups that really do seem to know the Bible better, but they're like more academically focused that... that Focus on rightness rather than love. And it's like, I, I wish that we could all pool our strengths together and be a help to the body. You know, we're like a married couple sleeping in separate beds, the Christian body. Got real quiet on that one too. I'm not going to go there. Anyway. <clears throat> huh? No. <laughs> I could go more, but I will not. <laughs> judgment. Pass judgment on the deeds and words of others. Determine motive. 
and call into question. So all of this stuff is, is judgment, what we do to each other. So when we, are, when we assume motive, we are no longer open to understand. You know, the first principle we were working from is seek to understand before seeking to be understood. The moment that you assume why that person did what they did, you're no longer open to understand them and where they are. And remember all that stuff we talked about last week, the types of listening, rephrasing, saying back to them what they just said so that to see if you actually understand where they are. And if, you don't, if, you're not, if, you're, if you've made a judgment, in other words, somebody did something in your marriage and you say, well, they did, oh, here's the, I'll boil it all down to this. They did that because they don't love me. That, that's kind of what underneath of everything when we judge these motives. And this is where the behavioral stuff comes in because we all do different things for different reasons. So when you discover that you need to actually listen to understand and then you engage in one of these like five love languages, which is a very simple thing. We did that Wednesday. I would encourage you all to do that. Five, the number five, lovelanguages.com. Go through that profile for free. We have some of those books back there. But uh, then you start to incorporate, all right, People are different. I do things different. They do things differently. And we do them for the different reasons. People actually do the same things for different reasons. Externally, you can't look at a particular action and assume the same motive for everything. So within marriage, when something is said or done and then we sit and dwell on it, we distance ourselves and we back ourselves away from it because we put our motive on them. Well, if, that, well, if I would have said that, that, I would be really angry. It would take, for, for me to say that, I would have to be so angry that I, I don't know that I would even love that person. And so we, we and, and remember, you get back more than you sowed, especially in the mind of the other person. They may not come back at you with their words, but in their mind, they're building it up into this big thing. You ever done that? You have, they've said something and you build it up into this big thing and then you get the chance later to actually talk about it and you're like, I don't know why I was making such a big deal about that. Like, I don't, I don't know why, why I let that bother me so much. Or you don't talk about it, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more and more distance. It's what we do with God, and it's what we do with each other. Right? We, we, create, we let so much distance for lack of understanding get us to a place where we're not open to Him anymore, and we're not open to each other anymore. <clears throat> so, careful about assuming motive. Ask questions. If something is done in your household where you don't understand the action, don't assume the motive, ask. And here's how you can ask. You can say, you know, you did this and it really made me feel this way. Or you did this and it affected me this way, right? You did this and I don't really understand why you did that, right? Are you with me? So ask questions. You know, you, you did this and it affected me this way. I don't, I don't, help me understand here why, what's going on in our marriage. Why, why did we do that? Why did you do that? In other, in other words, I, you don't love me anymore. Don't go there. All right. So we must remove from our own eye the plank that blinds us from seeing the needs of others. This is just something that I feel like is an important principle within this situation. When you judge motive, you're no longer open to understand them, and you no longer see that person. Remember back in Psalm one of the reasons, one of the things that produced the response of love and trust back to the Lord was that He saw where they were in their problems. He saw where they were in their issues and, and where they needed mercy. You know, I wonder in our marriages if we even see the other person in their struggles anymore. Like, we, I think what we do is we get to a point where their struggles are an inconvenience for us. And, I, and it's like, we got to remember, this person committed to you for your life. Their whole life, they're, they're, they've committed to spend with you, to help you. So you better take the time to understand each other. Just go ahead and take the time as, much time, as much effort as it takes to spend being angry and stay away from them and deal with all those emotions. Go ahead and put that effort into stepping back into it. It's worth it. The fight is worth it. Now, there should be rules to the stepping back into the ring. You know, when you, all that stuff that you're not addressing any longer, there's rules to it. You know, you're not cutting each other off at the knees. You're not, you know, you're not getting personal, all that kind of stuff. I think we all pretty much know what that looks like. But it's true. It's worth it. It's worth it to stay in there and work through these types of things. 
So I wonder, ask, I, I want to ask you that. Those of you that have mar been married for a while, those of you that are about to get married, we have all ends of the spectrum here. It's, it's like, are your spouse's issues an inconvenience to you or do you have mercy for them in that area? And if you have mercy for them in that area, you open up your heart to hear the Lord and hear them, right? Now, that doesn't mean that the other person just gets to stay stuck, right? There should be forward motion for both parties. You, that doesn't mean you're just going to give them an excuse to stay stuck, but you're going to step from a different perspective and look at it. And, you know, I've got to find some mercy here in this situation. I can't just let this drive me further and further away. I can't just learn to cope and shut off in this area and not deal with it. And they're just that. And it's not, you know, it's not that bad. It's like, it's not that bad. We can deal. I can deal with this. And, and we do that with our sin. We do that with our relationships. We tuck it away into a little corner of safety. It's like, I can, I can deal with this level of guilt, right? I can deal and manage this. You know, it's not really affected my life. I play with it over here a little bit every now and then. We do that with our spouses too and our issues. It's like we, we shove stuff away, but they create more and more and more distance. Remove that thing from your eye, and that thing to remove from your eye is judgment. In context of what he's saying is don't judge. You hypocrite, first remove what's in your eye so that you can see clearly to help them remove what's in their eye. The thing that is in your eye more than anything is your judgment about what's in their eye. So in other words, your judgment that's this big thing in your eye that's not letting you see them is your judgment about them. It might be your sin. It might be the things you've got to deal with. It could be that too. But more specifically, it's whatever it is that's clouding you from seeing them. And only you can answer that question, right? Why, why am I so agitated with my spouse? What is going on? Why do I feel this? Why can't I, why can't I set this aside and, and re-engage in intimacy? Why is it that I feel like I have to have this distance for a while? What is going on inside? And you don't, you're, not, you're not looking in a self-condemning kind of way. You want to ans ask those questions in a way where you're actually seeking an answer to remove the plank. What is it that is causing me to not see What's, whatever my spouse is actually going through clearly that's causing me to have the distance. I say, I don't, I don't even want to look, you know. Are you with me? We do that, and we put ourselves in these safe little corners, and we don't deal with it. Say, deal with it. Deal with your stuff, I'm telling you. It's worth it. That person is committed to you. That person loves you. That person wants to have a thriving, healthy relationship. As much as they can, right? I get it. I understand some people are unequally yoked or whatever. I'm, I'm talking about those of us that are, that are serious about working in our marriages. So <clears throat> if we truly love our spouse, we'll lay down our selfishness and put them first. This is true of all relationships, but we're mostly talking about spouses, right? You're not a doormat. They don't get to stay stuck. They don't get to use your mercy as an occasion to not deal with their stuff. But we love the Lord because He first loved us, right? Jesus, when we were dead in our sin, Jesus died for us. He's the model of love, is He not? When we were dead in our sin, hell-bound, enemies of Him in our mind, contrary to Him in our nature, He died for us in that moment. He laid down his life. No greater love is there in the world than someone lay down their life for another. And it's hard because we think, well, they should lay down their life first. If they do this, then I'll do this. Sounds real good, Clint. I mean, I appreciate it. I'm, I think I'm really... You know, as soon as they do this, then I'm going to do that. And so then it's like, who gets to go first? Who's going to go first? Who will go first? And I like this... It may have been stolen from me and put on a t-shirt. Easy. <laughs> I'm kidding. Love goes first. That, that, that's really the big takeaway that I want you to walk out of here with today. Love goes first. Just say it. Love goes first. All right. So where are you withholding love is a big question. Stolen is a strong word. I feel bad now. I love you, man. <laughs> Forgive me. They actually changed it anyway. So. 
，妈呀，早点。Because <laughs> you're making money off yours, I mine just a screen picture on a screen. <clears throat> where where are you withholding love? Think about that. Where do you withhold love in your marriage? Now, some of you are in situations where you got to protect yourself. Your other spouse is a little nutty and crazy right now. For real, I get that. But we're talking about in a situation where both are working toward each other. Where, where, where are you withholding it? We know the obvious. Re- we know the obvious areas, right? It's couples, if you don't know, you probably know. We fight over money. Kids and sex, typically, is what's fought over, and the other spouse's behavior. But those are the areas that get affected the most. My pastor used to say, "If you didn't have all those kids, you'd have more money, and you'd probably have more sex." <laughs> but that's not. That's kind of fun. Anyway, where are you withholding love? It's a big question. Love goes first, but I want you to ask yourself in your spouse and your in your relationship, where am I withholding it? Now you may think that your marriage is perfect, but just ask your spouse: Do you feel like I'm withholding love for you? Is there an area where you don't? I I I'm not loving you well. You know those those are tough questions to give yourself permission to actually have that type of conversation. You know, it's like things are pretty good right now, but. Like, is there an area where you feel like either unloved or, or rejected, or you know, is it, let, let's talk. Let's talk about this. <clears throat> so, check your motive before trying to remove the splinter from their eye. Love is able to see the wrong and still nurture the good. Amen. You know, like like I, I like the analogy of when you're digging for gold, you got to go through a lot of dirt. And then that gold might have a lot of dirt on it, right? But the gold in and of itself is valuable, and that's what you cherish. Of course, you're going to see a little bit of dirt, but they're worth it. This person is a blessing to you. This person has been joined to you in this mystery of marriage, this mystery that Paul says is a, is a, is a relationship that reflects our union with the Father. To the degree that we cherish that and we honor and respect that. Honestly, in a real way, I mean, this you know, this is a very intimate union that you are in with this person. What does it look like? You know, and and I, you know, there, there's people watching online. There's people in this room. I get it. You know, they're, they're, your marriage is at a place where it's like, man, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried, and I just don't know. There's a lot. It seems like there's a lot of work. It seems like there's a lot of work to do. Well, there may be, but ask yourself: Is it worth it? Would you want them to try? Would you want them to work? Who's going to go first, right? Love's going to go first. Until our motive, until love is our motive, we can't trust our intentions. I mean, I don't know how many times we go into these situations and we're like, well, if I do this, then I know that they're going to do this, and we play chess, right? We play chess with our relationship and our actions and our words and our everything about the relationship. <clears throat> rather than just peeling it all back. I'm free to love you when I set you free from my judgments. You know, this is, this is even true of God. This, this is why it's so important to theologically understand that Jesus was judged in your place. God is not holding your sin against you. That, that, it's mind-blowing. It's in Scripture. It was prophesied hundreds of years before the Messiah came. That promise was sealed in the blood of Christ. But yet when you preach it, people lose their minds because they think that you're saying it's okay to sin, but what you're really saying is no. We are actually approaching the Lord in a way where we can experience the type of transformation that performance-based religion makes a must, hammers you with. You know, it's like Jesus talking about the Pharisees. It's like, you search the Scriptures, you know the Scripture, but their hearts are far from me. You know, we, we, we know how to do marriage, but a lot of times our hearts are far from each other. I'm free to love you. So, so understanding that Jesus was judged in our place you know, that, 
an unhealthy person would use that recklessly. An unhealthy person that doesn't understand the character of God's intention toward them, evidenced in the act of judging Christ in His place. If you, if you hear that and you think that in some way that's advocating licentiousness or sin or destructive behavior in any way, you don't understand a healthy relationship. Externalists, performance-based religion preachers, most of what we hear in Christianity does not understand the heart of God, does not understand why it's important to know deeply within you and live within the truth that Jesus was judged in your place. That's why Paul had to say, you know, they'd said, well, are you saying we should continue in sin? Well, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? What? No, God forbid. Don't you know you're free? No. Why would, you, why would you want to live any longer like that? Live under grace. Live under the power of this relationship, this union with the Father. But it's true in our relationships too. Love keeps no record of wrong. Well, they're going to get away with it. Well, you don't understand what the power of love then. Love heals. Love makes whole. Love opens the heart to experience transformation. Love will heal, heal your marriage. Well, but if I love them, then that means that I'm approving of their behavior. No, it doesn't. You need to change what you think about love. Do you think God, in dying for us, was worried? He knew that the power of His love for us, right? Now, of course, because of our free will, some people do take it and live ridiculously, unfortunately. Not a good idea. But that's the model. He is not holding our sin against us. May it be true in our marriages also, right? Because there's a spiritual truth. See, <clears throat> you can't teach spiritual truth. Are you with me? Can I kind of dig into this just a little bit more? You can't teach a spiritual dynamical, dynamic truth. Dynamical. Is that a word? No, it is now. Dynamical. That's the title of the next series, Dynamical. <clears throat> what I mean by that is this. It, it's contrary to logic. It's contrary to carnal logic to set someone free, to say, you're free from my judgment. I'm not going to hold that against you. You are free. Go. Be who you are. Live how you want to live. Do what you want to do. But see, here's the thing. Spiritually, what that communicates to us, and, the, and it creates the type of connection to where it's like, there's a deeper connection where now I can actually trust this person because I don't feel like that they're going to try to correct me or not correct, but judge me, try to fix me, all of that kind of stuff that happens on a deeper level. Religion does not under... Those of you are... Man, I'm telling you what. The gospel is the power. One of the main tenets of the gospel is God is not holding your sin against you. Be reconciled to God. It's the ministry that we've been given. 2 Corinthians 5 verifies three different old covenant prophets that told us that when the new covenant was cut, we would be in the kind of relationship with the Father where the Father is no longer holding your sin against you. That is what you must go and tell people. And if you get flack back from the religious mindset that says... You're giving people a license to sin. Don't judge them. Just understand they don't really know the power of love. They don't really know the gospel of peace. They don't really, for some reason, there's a miscalculation in their mind and they hear permissiveness. They don't understand how love brings us to wholeness. It's just a fact. We, you must tell people that. Now, doesn't, you don't back it up with, you know, uh, irresponsible stuff that you make up. Stick to Scripture. But it's just so true. You know, freedom. It, it, it's, it's even what this nation was founded on. It just really is. You know, there's a deeper spiritual thread. And I'm not saying that this is God's nation. And, you know, people get weird about that type of stuff. But they understood the freedom that we have in Christ. It's why I know that those guys were Christians because you don't come up with a concept following Buddha. 
or being some animist like every rock has a spirit. They were just deists like there's a natural order to things. That God doesn't value and understand freedom. That God doesn't relate to people in such a way that sets them free and then creates a pathway for them to manage that freedom well to experience life abundant. That's how I know that this nation was founded on the Christian godly principles because it's based on freedom. It's based on personal responsibility. It's based on you're free, now manage it well. Who was it that said, we gave you a republic if you can keep it? Jefferson? Franklin? It's true. God's like, I gave you a new covenant. I hope you live well within it. It's, it's like the same thing. Man, I love it. So to wrap this up, ask yourself, who's going to go first? Love goes first. Are you going to choose love? Are you going to choose love? And what does love look like? Well, jump over to 1 Corinthians 13. Run through that order of what love looks like. You know, do a study on what love looks like. We know what it looks like relationally. We know what it looks like with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit. They bring a woman caught in adultery who should have been killed in that moment for her act. Jesus said, I don't condemn you. Now, go and sin no more because it's going to get worse for you if you continue in that behavior. That's what freedom is. That's what, see, that, that created a pathway for her to then trust Him. May we do that for our spouses, right? May we set them free. May we be able to love them to the degree that they trust us and they come to us. If your spouse is hiding from you, you have more work to do than they do. Love goes first. Amen? So this Wednesday, I'm going to go into, I kind of touched on it, but not a lot, but I'm going to go into the DISC stuff <clears throat> and talk about you know, practically how that relates. I put, I put a link in the Forward Church Facebook group, Forward Church Online, that to a free DISC assessment. If you're not in that group, if you don't do Facebook, you can just search free D-I-S-C profile online and take it. Go through it and share, you know, read it to understand yourself first. Share the results with your spouse, learn them, and then what you do is you adapt the, to their communication style. So we're going to talk about that, what that looks like, you know, uh, this coming Wednesday. I'm actually going through a certification as a DISC coach just because it, it, there's so much value in it, not for some kind of business thing, but just just to help within our, our counseling internally and some of the, the courses. And it just it, it improves all the communication things that we're, we're looking at. You know, we, we as a staff, we take this stuff seriously. We sit around and we talk about how can we, how can we, you know, how can we provide things that add value to your lives? How can we structure and organize and have ministries that are actually valuable? You know, there's a lot of things that we could be doing as a church that we're not doing because we value freedom as well. You know, it's like a lot of churches, I think, do things because they feel like that they're supposed to do them. And so then what happens is, is they burden their people. It's like constantly hammering you for finances, constantly hammering you to give up your time and come and serve in one of these things. I would rather approach it in such a way where we're not trying to program you into staying in this church. If you feel disconnected, find a place to serve. Ask somebody out to lunch. But <clears throat> I want... You know, we, we kind of, just as an example, we structured in such a way where we set you free. Now, I pray that you have a heart to serve. And if you have something on your heart, come speak with us. And we've been doing that. And so, like, there's three different things that are starting or continuing to go because people have said, well, I feel like I really want to do this. And they've come and they've met and we've talked. And one was Ryan and Lauren, which I asked them to help, but it was on their heart to do, the Financial Peace University you know, take advantage that advantage of that. The programs that we're going to have are supporting the things that are on your heart. So I want to hear from you. You know, we went through that whole last series, and some people, you know, it's good information. But if you if you're sitting in this place, and there's you know a lot of people out today, people watching online, whatever. If you call this your church home and you're local, and you feel like, well, I just don't feel like that there's a place for me here. I don't feel like that there's a place for me to to serve. There's not much need here. What's going on? I mean, I, I don't know. Schedule a time. Come sit with me. Let's talk. I want to hear what's on your heart. 
You know, if you're if you if you're sitting in that place and you're like, oh, I don't know, I, I, I like this place. I'd like to be here. People seem nice. I like the message, but I don't feel like there's really a place for me. It's not really anything for me to do. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's not true. It might mean that there's something within you that you just haven't actually stepped out in. I would love to talk to you about it. Schedule a time. Come sit with me. Let's see what that looks like. We've got the Financial Peace University. Courtney's doing a Bible study on Sunday nights. And then Tammy is uh, going to be doing this thing about <clears throat> going through Dr. Carolyn Leaf's 21-day brain detox thing. It's really cool. You'll hear more about that coming up. I'm all over the place today. That's the fourth announcement. Love goes first. Say that. Love goes first. Love goes first. Amen. Amen. It's just true. It's just true. You know, if you want to make a decision in your heart today to commit to love in your relationships, in your marriage and in your relationships, just, just, just tell yourself in this moment, I love my spouse. I love my friends. I love my children. I love them. I want them to know that I love them. And as I love them, there's more going on than just us having a healthy relationship. We're nurturing the union that we are in with the Father. <clears throat> and we're setting ourselves up to be a testimony to the world of what God's love looks like. Father, I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you, I thank you for my spouse. I specifically thank you for Sarah. She's perfect for me. And I, and I want to cherish that. I want... I want that relationship to be even healthier. I thank you that you're, you're, you're just helping us. You're helping us remember. You're helping us go even deeper than maybe we've ever gone before into love within our relationships. And we open our hearts to be led and taught by you. They deserve it. They deserve to be loved because you died for them. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that wisdom and that direction. And I'm committing to love in my relationships. Amen.